Okay, so today we're going to talk a little bit more about drag, and we're going to get a little bit more specific about it. If you've watched the last video, and if you haven't, you probably should. Uh, we at least talked about how drag is proportional to how quickly an object is moving through a medium, whatever that medium is, whether it's air, water, or some other fluid. And we want to know things like, how are we going to predict the size of the drag force? How does it affect different objects? Does the size of the object matter? Does the mass of the object matter? Does its cross-sectional area matter? Does its density matter? Does the nature of the fluid matter? All of these th th things. In general, uh, drag is a very complicated force, but we're going to apply a very simple model to it that actually does a reasonably good job of predicting the behavior of a whole wide range of objects as they move through things like air and water, okay? So remember our little diagram from last time? Uh, this is drawn so that we would have the drag force and the force of gravity exactly balancing one another. So uh, this, this gentleman would be at uh, terminal speed or terminal velocity, okay? And in this case, as I've, as I've already laid it out here, okay? When you've got something as, as large as a human being, or as large as a human being, plus the, uh, the parachute here, well, you are almost certainly in a case where the thing that dominates drag is the pressure of the air colliding with the skydiver and their parachute, okay? So it's not that um, there's some sort of, well, there is, but it's not that the friction between the air molecules and the surface of this thing is what dominates it. You're literally just running into huge volumes of air as you drop at uh, terminal velocity, okay? And you have to push that out of the way, essentially. And that kind of drag uh, usually dominates when you're talking about large objects objects or fast velocities, you know, maybe hundreds of meters per second in, in air, though it can be lower depending on the size of the object, okay? But large objects, large speeds, or both, okay? And when you have that condition, like you do with skydiving, like you would if uh, you dropped a large rock off the top of a building or something like that, well, then the equation for drag approximately looks like what we've got here. And I've identified some of the key parameters that are abbreviated here. You've got the fluid density, that's this Greek letter, um, sort of like the letter P, but a little bit different. It's called rho. rho. And C is the drag coefficient. You may have seen drag coefficients for, I don't know, cars, okay? It's just a number. It depends a lot on uh, how aerodynamic, if you're moving through air, um, the shape of the car is. So things that are sort of teardrop shape tend to be very nice. Things that are just big blocks with sharp corners and things like that, like semis, tend not to be very, um, tend not to have very low drag coefficients. They have very high drag coefficients, and so their force uh, due to drag, with all other parameters being equal, would be larger. Okay, because the air flows around them, uh, or they cut through the air less efficiently. And then A is the cross-sectional area of an object. So if you were to just illustrate that, because I think most people have an idea of what cross-sectional area is, but not everyone. So if you have, uh, say, um, a sphere, and you wanted to look at the cross-section of this sphere, well, you'd kind of slice through it, right? And if you slice through it, you would get a disk, right? And if uh, we wanted to use for a different example, if we had like a cylinder, something like this, okay? And this cylinder was, you know, dropping vertically that way. Well, then the cross-sectional area would be represented that if you sort of cut through the cylinder and you looked at the area of this little circle that you would get if you sort of cut through and then laid it out flat, that would be the cross-sectional area, all right? And so a skydiver, right, can change their, co their cross-sectional area by either sort of aiming their head downwards so that they present a smaller cross-section, or if they're sort of belly flopping like this guy is, um, they would have a larger cross-sectional area and would have proportionally more drag, uh, all other things being equal. Their drag coefficient would probably change a bit too. But anyway, uh, cross-sectional area is A, 
and there's uh, our v squared that we talked about in the last video, all right? Now, most of these things are just things you would look up, okay? So there's the density of air or water or whatever medium you're moving through. The drag coefficient would be dependent on the shape and also the degree of polish or bumps or whatever on the material uh, surface. And then the cross-sectional area of an object is something that's reasonably well-defined too, okay? Unless it's really irregular. <clears throat> Those things are mostly lookups. More or less, you would be supplied with those, or perhaps you wouldn't need them for certain calculations. But the, the big thing we want to take away is when this thing applies, which is when, you again, you have relatively large objects or relatively high speeds, or um, you are dealing with both of those things. Okay? It's not that small objects, for instance, uh, cannot have this form of drag ac acting on them. For example... Um, something like a bullet moving at hundreds of meters per second has a very strong dependence on just pushing the air out of the way. And so it uses this even though it's a very small thing, okay? Now, if you took that bullet and you dropped it, like you can fire it out of the gun, but you just dropped it, so it was moving at most like, you know, a couple of meters per second, well, then you would have a situation where, one, drag forces entirely would be really quite small, and two, probably the other form of drag would dominate. Let's look at that one. Okay, uh, that is, uh, usually applies to either very small objects. We have this lovely little protozoan with all its little cilia here wiggling away, propelling it around, okay? Um, not only for protozoan, okay? But um, the viscosity drag, okay, is this equation here. And technically this, this only applies to um, sort of a specialized situation where you have a well-defined radius of the object. So you're you, technically you're looking at a, something that, like something like a sphere dropping through a fluid or moving through a fluid. But in general, this is gonna apply for objects that are small, objects that are moving for, through a very viscous material, fluid rather. So air is not very viscous compared to water and water is not very viscous compared to something like, I don't know, corn syrup or something like that, okay? So viscosity is sort of how easily the fluid flows around the object. Sort of, sort of how sticky, but not exactly. So how easily it flows. And uh, radius of the object is pretty uh, self-explanatory. That sort of relates, again, sort of to this cross-sectional area. You've got a six pi, a numerical factor that comes out of the derivation for this, and you've got uh, velocity again. But velocity here is not squared, right? It's uh, linear in velocity, if you're uh, familiar with that term, right? So as the velocity goes up, you get a linear increase in the force due to drag from the so-called viscosity term in the force, in the drag force acting on that thing. And again, this dominates for Things like objects moving very slowly, um, compact objects, so things that perhaps have quite a bit of mass but are very small, so like a ball bearing or something like that. Or, okay, uh, things that are moving slowly and are in, say, a very viscous fluid. So if you're um, a boat and you're moving through water, then probably the viscous term is dominating when you are at very low velocities, unless you have a very strange uh, hull shape or something like that. Boats, though, in general, are a very difficult thing to determine the drag force on precisely. Um, we'll, we'll take a look at those in a moment, okay? So you have kind of two different regimes, depending on a few different factors, and we've talked about a couple of them here. You can either have the drag force looking like this and proportional to the square of the velocity of the object, like our skydiver, or you can have something like this, dominating the drag on an object, and that's only linear in velocity and tends to apply again to small objects or objects moving through very viscous fluids, that kind of thing. The other uh, parameter that I didn't discuss is the idea that, of turbulence, and so turbulence in general is a very complicated thing. Um, you need quite complicated mathematics to model turbulence coming off of an object. But if you have an object that is moving through a fluid and is creating lots of 
ripples, lots of whirls, lots of vortices and things like that. Like, uh, like an airplane, right, creates a lot of turbulence off of its wings and whatnot. Then you have a situation again where the drag force is going to be dominated by this, uh, this equation that is proportional to v squared rather than this equation that is proportional to v. If you have uh, so-called laminar flow, in other words, you have some object and if you were to sort of look at the fluid flow around, it would all look very smooth, right, as it moved around it, okay? That's called laminar flow, rather than the thing coming off and like whirling around. You can take map out these sort of whether or not you have smoother turbulent flow by adding like little fluorescent beads and things like that to fluid and then watching it with a camera as it flows around an object. They do this kind of thing. Um, or you can like put smoke into the air or something like that. And they do this kind of thing with a high speed camera in wind tunnels and whatnot. In any case, okay, I won't, I won't be asking you highly technical questions about exactly uh, how turbulent something is or something, but if you go on to talk about drag in any of your other classes, well, it's, it's nice to have this basic stuff in your back pocket. All right? So, uh, one last thing, and it's important to say this, that technically in any object, the drag for any object, the drag force is a combination of these two terms. So you have the so-called pressure term, and you have the so-called viscous term. I think I have that text in here, okay? And oh, I apparently don't, okay? But this is the pressure term, and this is the so-called viscous term. It sometimes goes by other names, okay? And it's not that the viscous term completely goes away if you have drag for, if you have a large object like a skydiver moving through air. It's just that this term, the pressure term, dominates this. Sometimes like by factors of, you know, 10 to the 6th or 10 to the 10th or things like that. And so it's, you can fairly ignore that other one. But that's not always the case. And uh, vice versa, if you have a very small object or slow-moving object or something moving through a very viscous fluid, it's not that this pressure term is gone. It just it's a much smaller contribution compared to the viscous term. Right? Uh, one very complicated system where both of these things come into play are things like ships, right? So if you are sitting there on a ship, one, you have two different mediums that it's moving through. Sure. In most cases, the drag force is going to be dominated by the much heavier and more viscous fluid, the water, that the ship is moving through. But the drag you get from the air is not insignificant, and particularly at higher speeds. And so also would be present. You'd end up with actually, like, what, four terms. You'd have sort of a viscous and a pressure term for both mediums as you, as you move through them. And so boat, boat hulls are designed to minimize drag under sort of the normal operating regimes of the ship. So if it's generally going to be cruising around at 10, 12, 15 knots, well, then you're looking, generally speaking, to make this term, right, the one where you're just pushing the water out of the way and creating that wake, uh, as small as possible, which is why you don't have ships, uh, well, there's other reasons for that, that are, say, <laughs> very, very short, but very, very wide or something like that, okay? Long and skinny, less drag, because you're just pushing less stuff out of the way, all right? So that's a brief intro, intro to drag. If you're in my engineering physics class, we're going to have another uh, lecture just on a little bit of the calculus that can go into calculating the force of drag. You'll notice that because of this velocity term, right, if we were thinking about the motion of an object, we would have a situation where the f drag force is not constant because if there's any acceleration at all for the object, well, then you have the situation where the, one of the forces in the free body diagram of the object would actually be changing, and that can profoundly affect the motion of the object as time goes by. And uh, we'll, we'll take a look at, uh, for you engineers, on how to handle that. If any, any of uh, my general physics folks are interested, they can go check it out, and I will see you for that one in a little bit.